Hello everybody. This is what happens when you make your little signs. This is part two of the Peter Sinclair Gallery of American, Early American Crafts and Trades. Basically a, a, a room full of vernacular tools from uh, the 18th and 19th century. I always have to make a brief appearance. Bill Merchant here, Vice President of Ulster County Historical. Hopefully we worked up the little snags we had two weeks ago. I've actually got a different router right here um, in the same room, so we shouldn't get disconnected and I should be able to proceed in the manner in which I had planned, unlike the last time. Uh, hopefully there's some people here to ask questions, but otherwise you can see this out in the world fully recorded. Um, but let's just get going. Let's see what we've got to show you all today. Of course, I'm also having problems with my... Uh, my gimbal today, but that's just life, isn't it? <clears throat> Let's see here. Well, since I'm a D&H guy, I'll start with this one little item here. This is a very long, I mean very long, boat hook. This is almost, that's about a 12-foot boat hook. You know, the D&H Canal uh, after 1857 had locks that had... Um, they had, uh, um, what are you going to say, a gear house at the, at, at the end. And so you would need a long boat hook like this to fish the rope in if you were pulling in boats when the lock was all the way down. We don't know if that's the story of this boat hook like so many things here at Ulster County Historical, which has been in existence since 1858. We don't know where it came from. It has no story. <clears throat> um, it takes a while for organizations like ours to become professional and to start to uh, really collect the tales of what they have. Uh, Professional organizations, of course, accession things. We, you, you put them in a catalog and you write down where they came from and as much information as you can. But, uh, but we can't always all do that, can we? And sometimes you just have stuff. You don't know where you got it from. <clears throat> you know, when the D&H Canal, this is a great segue, if I do say so myself, when the D&H Canal came through, um, it all of a sudden opened up uh, the ability for extractive industries uh, um, <clears throat> to be exploited. So, for instance, Rosendale Cement is actually discovered when they're digging the D&H Canal. But I'm not going to talk about Rosendale Cement today. I'm going to talk right here about bluestone. So, bluestone is a naturally occurring sandstone uh, that's only found from northeastern Pennsylvania through New York State and up into Vermont. Okay, I promise that was me and not the electronics. It's just that my gimbal isn't really working, so I'm having to handhold. Okay, at any rate, here we are. Bluestone, naturally occurring uh, sandstone, also comes in green and red, but blue was the most sought after. And the reason why it was sought after is because when you dressed it up and made, say, a uh, sidewalk out of it, it wasn't slippery when wet. You can't make sidewalks out of stuff that uh, makes you slip and fall, right? Bluestone siding was, uh, uh, sidewalks and, and curbing was a really popular product. Uh, throughout the 19th century, a lot of New York City had bluestone sidewalks. Uh, I see them to this day in the town of Beacon. Marble Town had some original ones they replaced with new bluestone, as did Kingston, New York. Huge industry. Down in Pond Eddy on the Delaware, it was only the fact that the D&H Canal went through that they could exploit the bluestone, bluestone fields. But these are the tools that you would use, and these all came from uh, a family that donated them way back when. Uh, but you've got hammers. There's a piece of bluestone, so you know what we're talking about right there. Uh, some chisels and wedges, some stone hammers. I'm not uh, cognizant. I don't know enough about how to work bluestone. I'm a woodworker uh, more than anything else here. But here you've got a quarry in Hurley, New York. Um, these are from the Tom Conlon collection. And there you can see somebody dressing. And if you look at the side of that, that, uh, that stone, you can see the way that you split stone is that you would drill with a hand drill with a really tough bit. And then you do put in things called feathers and wedges. And what you're looking at right there is feathers and, and wedges. The feathers are the two pieces on either side. And there's the wedge. And you would actually take those two feathers and put them in the hole. And you'd have a, holes about six inches apart, a whole row of them. And then you'd take that hammer, like that one right there, just the way we set it up when, when Leslie Lefevre Stratton and I uh, curated this room last year. You can see you take that little hammer and you, you knock each wedge down. You go down the road and you keep doing that until the pressure of the feathers ca cause the bluestone to split. Um, intense backbreaking labor, largely the quarry Irish, as they were known. It was largely Irish immigrants. Do you know Irish, uh, uh, especially in the 19th century, they were just a, a step above uh, uh, people of color, black people. 
Um, in fact, you'll see the signs, Irish need not apply. You know, they were Catholics, and that was a, a strike against them. And, uh, and, and they were the marginalized. They would work for a lot less money than anybody else. And so as a consequence, they very often did the heavy labor like you might find in a bluestone quarry. We'll bring ourselves along. You know, I fixed that wire before the last time, and now I didn't fix it this time. Oh, well. Um, here we've got some items that were made for, made, excuse me, by a, a local blacksmith. You would not have a settlement without having somebody who could shoe your horses and make you the sorts of things you might need. Anything from, uh, um, well, you know, I wish I knew what some of these things were. There's a branding iron, you know, this, I, I said I was a woodworker, right, at, at the outset. These are two sets of branding irons here, the, 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 right along in here. These hoops, Lord knows what they came from. Here's a wonderful a bale handle. Um, would have been made by your blacksmith. And that, that, that you know, Leslie, I, you know, I should have looked this up if we knew exactly what that hanger is. But the kinds of things a blacksmith might, might uh, make for you. We're going to go over. I'm going to skip a few tools in here because they belong to the woodworking tree felling story. We're going to go to some other things that are in this box. First, you've heard about people wanting to build a better mousetrap. We think that's what this is. I'm not sure exactly how it's worked, but it's such an engaging little thing. Let's come down here and we'll take a look at it from the side if we can. You know, they, so there you go. You know, the better mousetrap or not. Actually, it may be like those plastic ones today. Um, there must have been something to make that door close in on the poor mouse. But the, the better, you know, never seen one like it. But here at, here at the Ulster County Historical, we have one to show you. And here's a, here's a lamentable story right here. What we've got here, let me see if we can read this, cockfighting. So even to this day, every time I, we talk about it, somebody says, yeah, down, down south a ways, I think they're still having cockfights. Um, taking roosters and, and, uh, and having them fight and betting on it. Big deal. And here's a, a print from the 19th century of a cockfight. We had this wonderful box here. You can see with all these different... Um, compartments, six of them all together, and inside were all sorts of things. There's a spur that you would put on the, as, as though his claws weren't uh, um, strong enough, that's a spur that would put, you put on, it's a really gruesome thing. We don't do these sorts of things anymore, thank goodness. Um, I'm not sure, again, you know, I'm not an expert in this particular stuff. Uh, if anybody knows what we're looking at, if I don't know, put it up in the comments. This is why I try and do these synchronous events. It's nice to have, I can see there's nine of you out there. Thank you for joining me. Hopefully, uh, many more might watch this, especially if they watched the last one and decided, oh, let's not watch him live. What if he keeps dropping in and out? But so far, so good. I, I anticipate now with the uh, router nearby, we shouldn't have any problem. But the, the most interesting thing to me right here was this handwritten note. <laughs> That's right. It says diarrhea. This is a bunch of um, different uh, uh, remedies. So it's a treatise. On the gamecock, so a gamecock in this case presumably was the fighting, the fighting rooster right here. But here's what you might give your 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 poor bird if it had diarrhea. You know the birds I've seen it's all they have. I, at any rate, I, I digress and pro, not, not 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 a topic for general. The general uh, there could be kids watching after all, right? But there you go. That's a uh, um, physic with oh, it's going to we. Uh, 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 they tell you how much by, by the size of a silver quarter, but it's, it's the cure for your Gamecock's diarrhea. You can't have them fighting if they've got, uh, if they've got digestive problems now, can you? So uh, now I think, let's see, we're, we're ready to bring ourselves around to woodworking tools. And so with that in mind, I'm going to start from the top, which is first you've got to cut the darn tree down, huh? Let's start, um, because probably this was the, the most common tool we're going to start with an 18th century felling axe. Look at the, speaking of blacksmiths, that's something your blacksmith would have made you right there. So there's an axe on, a, on just a nice solid handle. That would be used for whatever you need an axe for, but very often for cutting down a tree. And then we have here in the 19th century a much nicer axe. You can see here we've got... Uh, there's some initials on there, probably the owner's initials. If we look a little closer, Esopus, New York. Uh, so this was made in Esopus. I keep trying to get us a Napanok axe because they were very, it's said that nobody would go west in America without a, a Conestoga, Conestoga wagon 
or a Napanock axe. So they were making uh, axes in the early 19th century in Napanock, where the correctional facility, the so-called correctional facility is today. And then there's other sorts of axes. We get ahead of ourselves here, but this is such a beautiful example of a goosewing broad axe. And broad axes were specialized axes. Uh, I'm going to go and talk about them. Hey there, Henry. Good to see you. I'll talk about timber framing a little further down. We, we, we've barely taken the tree down. So later on, you might instead of... Uh, might even better from the other side of the room. You, there we go. You can see right there. Here's a pair of felling axes. You, the, the, the teeth here, this one would definitely be... Oh, thank you for that axe, uh, Henry. Um, these are two, uh, two man axes for taking down trees. You've probably possibly seen pictures of a man on either side and a big giant tree being taken down. That's the start if you're going to build your house, if you're going to build, a, if you're going to get firewood, you've got to get that tree down first. If you're going to farm, you had to take the tree down. The native peoples, a little aside, would do what they called girdling. They would simply cut a circle at the base of the, the bark, at the base of the tree, all the way around. And within a season, by cutting the entire uh, um, outer covering, no moisture, no nutrients could get up in the tree and it would kill it. And that's girdling. Uh, the native people, very smart. Uh, they, they worked uh, uh, smart, not, not hard. They had stone axes in the tough. They didn't have metal until European settlers, settlers come over in the 17th century, probably well, 15th and 16th, but really 17th century uh, in this area uh, is when people start settling and the natives' people start uh, interacting. And this is another interesting right here. Uh, Ron Sharkey, if you were out there, this, yeah, just, there we go. It's a saw vice. Two-man saw. That's right, Chester. That's what these are. And this is a saw vise that I purchased from an antique dealer friend of mine. Um, you use a saw vise if you're going to set the teeth and sharpen them. And this is almost sculptural. It looks so pretty. Uh, this is on loan from my per permanent collection or uh, could become part of this permanent collection. We'll just have to see. Good to see you, Chester and Henry, gentlemen. And since we're over here and we have so many, you know, saws, uh, metalworking, uh, we don't have steel until the middle of the 19th century. Metalworking, metal, very expensive. So early saws were made like this um, for a variety of different things. You probably you couldn't take down too big a tree, obviously, with this because there's your limit. These sorts of saws were probably used. They're called carriage maker saws in some instances. Were probably used for, for, for cutting down once you, uh, once you had uh, gotten the tree down with your axe or with your big two-person saw like over there. So here's another uh, frame saw. But think about it. When metal's very expensive, these saws use largely wood and save the metal for where they really needed it. <clears throat> and this next saw is uh, really important uh, because this is used for sawing veneers. So uh, for sawing logs uh, in, in, into... You, it wouldn't necessarily even have to be veneers. You could take a big, long log, it could be this big, and you could saw this way to get slices out of it if you were going to just uh, um, saw it that way. Feathers and wedges. Thank you, Chester, for posting that. You're always great to have on here. Uh, wonderful. This sort of uh, saw, very often what you do with a big log is you put it over a pit, and you'd have what you call a pit saw. And, and this is of, of a sort. It's a little too small to be a true pit saw. Um, um, but... Uh, but it is of the type. And if you've ever heard top dog and bottom dog, well, one guy stood in the pit and handled one side of the saw, and the other guy was on top, top dog. Bottom dog got covered in sawdust and debris. Top dog was presumably the boss. Uh, I don't know. But this is a, this is a smaller, smaller saw of the same sort that might be used. I, I, have, a, I have one in my personal collection, but uh, we didn't have room to display such things here. So now you've got your tree down. What are you going to do with it next? Well, let's come over here. I told you I'd get back to these two. First off, these are debarking spuds. You see the heads of these two guys here. Let's see if I can give you a nice long look at them here. So there's a pair of spuds. This spud's for you. Always wanted to say that, huh? Good fun. All right. Um, yeah, so a spud is used to remove the bark from a tree. So uh, tanneries, guys would just go out with the tools we just saw, either saws or felling axes, they drop the tree, and then they would take the bark off because the hemlock and oak bark, mainly hemlock around here, um, was the favored material, had the right acidity to make leather. And there were a lot of tanneries along the D&H Canal and in this valley down in Napanoc, uh, 1810, some of the earliest uh, tanneries. Uh, I know there was one in Ellenville, I think, and along, uh, well, yeah, yeah, uh, just, uh, well, really, that was Napanoc, now that I think about it, uh, along the D&H. And then this is... Uh, this guy right here, 
would be for splitting, say, shingles or just splitting wood if you weren't going to saw. So um, for clapboard and, and shingles, you would use a, a, a this is a, a riving, what we call this exactly, a riving knife or a splitting fro. Sometimes I have to look at our, uh, <laughs> what's so funny, Rick? Hey, I should have you here making spoons, shouldn't I? It's kind of hot in here, though, I got to tell you. That's why I'm uh, not in a bow tie for this one today, folks. Too hot in the tool room. So there you go. So now you've got your, your tree down. What else might you do with the wood? Well, <clears throat> you had to build a house. And here is a wonderful, this box here. Let's, let me step back again. The way the room's laid out, I can only get so far back before I'm up against the case. Yeah, I finally got me a nice spud too there, Rick. Not that I've used it at all. Okay, focus in there. So this box on the top of it, actually, this was a wood, a house rights box. And this is just a, a handmade box to carry the tools that you might build a house. Uh, I don't know if the house building was itinerant or whether it was, I know families and people would get together. Um, and that's why I sort of waited to talk about the broad axe. So there's another broad axe right there. We have a lot of great broad axes. And here's one as well. And the broad axe um, would be used to square up a log. Um, what you would end up doing is you'd take the broad axe and you'd score on the rounded part. And then you'd go and you'd use a, an adz. And here is an adz head. I'm going to handle this. Normally we want to wear a pair of gloves, but I didn't expect to handle it. Um, there is an adz head. And here is a gutter adz. I said because of the shape of the head there. Here's a gutter adz. And it's on a handle. Most adzes were actually much longer handled than that. Uh, we didn't have, it's funny, of all the stuff you, you get. So we have these wonderful, we had tons of broad axes. That too would be a broad axe. And those were the kind of axes you'd use if you were building a house to square up for the post and beams. You would square up, as I say, you'd go with the, the axe and you'd put these every six inches or so, you, you, you'd, put, you'd score. And then you'd take the adz and you'd go very carefully between your legs and you'd scoop that out. And then you'd wind up with a beam. Hey, like this one, what do you know? I've got it right, uh, and you can see. So here we've got the score marks, and then you'd add them away, and that's how you make a square beam. And this is the way houses were made. You, 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 drop your, uh, you drop your tree, and then you'd square it up. Or in some instances, you wouldn't square it up. Here we've got it rounded, but here's where somebody addressed that surface. I don't know what made them decide to stop there, but as you can see, this is an original ceiling member here in the... Here in the uh, the tool room, which is this little stone building built on the back of probably the earliest part, but, but post-dates it. Um, this stone part of the building, when you, when you see the Bevere house has been added onto so many times. I don't know if anybody knows the true story of this house. That's something we're going to have to pull together at some point. So now that you've got your, your, your posts and beams made, you have to make mortises and tenons. A mortise would be a hole in which a, a, a then a tenon would go into and so this isn't really a mortise and tenor, but uh, let's see here. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> well, so it's, it's somewhat like. So you, you would make a, 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 I should have actually brought an, an example with me. I, I didn't think that through. At any rate, you would first drill a hole. And so you might use a drill like this one, a hand drill. And then later in the 19th century, some genius invented this wonderful uh, Thing to drill, you could just place it on, on the log. Well, clearly you're limited to to width, and you would just be able to drill down into stuff. And actually, you, what am I saying? You, the, the bits out here, you'd set it on top of your log, and you would be drilling here. Now that drill is just going to make a round hole, but ten tenons are square. So then the last thing you would need is a slick, a giant chisel. Let me get this way. We'll get the lighting better if I do it this way. There we go. That is a giant chisel known as a slick. This one's actually my, from my personal co collection, that may actually be a baseball bat. Very often you'll see baseball bats uh, replacement handles. And that, that slick was ham hammered on, and that's why that end looks like that. That's a no-no, folks. Well, certainly maybe with a wooden mallet, but not, not enough to split it like that. But there you go. So that, that's how you do timber framing. A lot of buildings prior to the middle of the 19th century were constructed with mortise and tenons handmade like that. And now here, let's, the coopering corner. John Cox, where's John? You know, here in High Falls, we actually have a cooper. 
Coopering refers to making a box out of a round box, basically. Um, a round wooden box. So that's what a cooper did. And so what we're seeing right here are all sorts of things that a cooper would make. No ship of discovery would go without a cooper and these staves for barrels because he would make the barrels that stuff would get stored in. But coopers did all sorts of stuff. I mean, they made sap buckets. Uh, they made small barrels for uh, nails or for, uh, for, for whatever, for, for your milk pail. They would make firkins for butter and for cheeses. They would make wash tubs. Uh, and of course, regular different size barrels, depending. You had white coopers and black coopers, tight coopers and loose coopers, um, dry or wet. Um, a wet cooper could make a, a barrel that could hold liquid. And so you would be making cider and cider, uh, hard cider, and you might make brandies and beer. All of these things would require a cooper. So everybody knows a cooper makes barrels, but in fact, they did make anything that was a round box. And we have a wonderful collection of the various uh, um, uh, sizes and types of coopered items. And what we also have right here are these giant planes. So a plane has got an iron or a cutting edge there, a wedge so you can adjust it. And then on this end, you can run a piece of wood along here and this blade is out just enough to take a nice piece off it. And these... Coopers would use these giant planes to make the staves. Each stave had to be angled just right. Uh, barrels, uh, now when they're made like this, they don't have to be pulled together. But when they're made like this, the center will touch and the, and the, uh, the, the hoops are what make it close up. Imagine the skill it took to make a, a, a watertight wooden box like that with just these sorts of tools. And yet they were doing it since the Egyptian times. Coopers, very important and a lost trade in this day and age. Hey there, Victoria. Nice of you to join us. But then we have some other coopering tools as well right here in this case. Um, that's a sun plane. That's to, once you had your barrel together, that's to plane the top of it. This, uh, this is a howl. And that's used to cut. It's kind of hard to see. Let's go down here again. That actually cuts the... Uh, cuts the, the, the groove that the lid's going to go into. So in a regular barrel where it's like that shape, um, the lid would fit in this top part. The, the, this band wouldn't be on it, and it, it'd be open, and you'd place the lid in, and the howl was the way that, uh, um, was the way that, that uh, you cut. <clears throat> I guess you'd actually, John could answer this. I think you'd actually have to put the hoop on it, cut it with the, with the, uh, with the howl, and uh, chamfer it, if you will, and then you, you'd have to open it up again and put the lid in. Whenever you see these short-handled tools, they're called Cooper's tools. Well, oops, that's not real. Oh, that does work for you, doesn't it? So this is a Coopering ads. So after the turn of the 20th century, when you had metal um, rings, prior to that they were made out of wood, huge winter in industry for farmers and canalers and the like would be to make barrel hoops. Uh, to set those barrel hoops, you'd use this thing here, a hoop setter. But with the metal ones, you could use this. But the ads, you see, has also got a cutting head, just like our friend the other ads over here. Same tool, but with a much shorter handle because you might be working inside a little barrel, right? So you, you, you couldn't have a big handle. It'll just get in your way. And so that beautiful axe right there, I'm going to turn this way again because we'll see the whole thing. It's got some wonderful markings on it, very early. That's a Cooper's broad axe. And it's a Cooper's broad axe because of the small side of the size of the head and the very short handle. So something you might be trimming excess wood on the inside of your barrel. This is a great little tool, a bung bore. It, it both drills and then makes a tapered hole for the bung. The bung is the plug that would be in the side of the barrel for your barrels that had, say, whiskey or... Uh, or, or cider or brandy. Whiskey, that was a great way, you know, the whole point of whiskey was that you could take your wheat crop, if you were far away from some place to sell it, it might spoil before you could get a market. But if you turn it into whiskey, then it's just better the longer it takes, isn't it? And so making whiskey was a, was a way for a farmer to uh, add value and to, and to make his product, make a product that he could market, even if he was far away from markets. And so once you made that bung 
uh, drilled the bung hole, drilled it, and then tapered it, we have a wooden bung hammer to, 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 to finish out the, the Cooper's tools here. Um, and that's just a wooden hammer to, to go and set that bung because it had to be nice and watertight. And they actually would uh, um, burn, they char the bung hole. If you go to the Quercus Facebook and Instagram pages, he'll show you various. He's making uh, barrels today, John Cox is, a modern-day Cooper. And here's an interesting axe that... Uh, um, They say it was a mortising axe, but in fact, from my reading, I think that these were primarily used to make fences. If you were making, you know, you needed to make the, the little mortise, the main use of this axe would be to cut. Um, it wouldn't be used in, in, it's a little too small for timber framing and the like. This, uh, this device would be used <clears throat> just for fence makers, primarily, at least according to one of the books. You've got to be careful. One of the books uh, had, had, had timber framing completely wrong, and it wasn't until I watched a YouTube video that I realized that they had it wrong. I won't bore you with what I had wrong. I'll just tell you what I got right, right? Coming on over here, here's another very small ads. Um, again, this would probably be considered for a cooper. With a wooden mallet would be a way you might work it. And rounding out woodworking tools. You know, when I first uh, was asked to, to work on the tool room here, I got very excited because I have a pretty extensive collection of uh, 18th and 19th century cabinet makers tools. Um, but what we have here really are just really common tools, tools that every farmer would have, tools that you sort of just needed to do anything around the house. So here we've got spoke shaves. There's two of them, three of them really, uh, draw knives, these guys here, and you might make barrel staves and you might make wood shingles with those. There's a smaller one there, a smaller draw knife. And you might very often sit on a, on a uh, I love this piece, I'll show this every time I can. That's a, that's a shave horse, and that would, that, you could sit there and uh, with this, with your foot, push this to a spot where the piece of wood's held there, and you could see actually the business end. Look at where they missed all the time and hit over here, and a little bit over here as well. I just think this one is so beautiful. I've seen an awful lot of shave horses. I know I went on about this one two weeks ago too, but this one's just like a, it's a sculpture. It's a work of art. It's so beautiful. Um, yeah, so with a shaving horse, you would then use these spoke shaves, uh, excuse me, draw knives, and then the spoke shave is that little wooden guy right there for finer work, very often for carriage spokes and the like. And uh, if you can see there, I'm going to go down here and show you from that side. That's a... Uh, wood there. This one's adjustable. You'll see some later ones. I have some in my personal collection where they've got, uh, instead of adjusting it with a hammer, like you would on this one, it's hard to see because it's on the underside, uh, they would actually have thumb screws to use instead. Then as we come along in here, people call these block planes because they're blocks of wood. In fact, that is not a block plane. That's a four plane. That's a, that's a plane you'd use for just about anything right there. Block planes are these little guys here. And a block plane is, to a woodworker, a small, so that's truly a block plane there. And this is what we call a coffin smoother. It's a smoothing plane. Because of its short face, you might use it for some work, but um, really what it was used for, in lieu of sandpaper, you would use a very sharp plane blade set just to take a little off, and you can smooth with that. And so that's what we call a coffin smoother because of the coffin shape. I'm gonna bring it, come, come around here and see if we can see the shape of it without, it's hidden behind stuff. Okay, I just was told I can't do that. Facebook, you can't rotate your phone on Facebook. Yeah, I know, that's uh, annoying. Then we got a pair of, uh, so these are the sorts of planes, if you had to do any little woodworking, get a door to fit again or that kind of stuff, um, knock together something that didn't take as much skill, maybe a box like that you might do, for instance. These are the tools that you might want to use, <clears throat> along with measuring tools. There's a chalk line right there with the blue chalk on it. That's not ancient chalk by any means. I get that chalk today. A set of dividers, very important for a cooper. The dividers is how they figured out how many staves. It's a whole bunch of complicated trigonometry. Um, but look at it. I love this. this. This square right here is the oldest metal tool I think I've ever seen. It's probably 18th century. And it's, look at the marks, and just it's really hard to see. You almost have to get it out of the case. At some point, maybe we'll do a more produced video of this room where we can handle stuff. But this, we wanted to just be here to talk to you folks, try and do it live. And, uh, and so far, so good.
So moving the router did the trick. And very last, I don't know if you can really see it, but right there, uh, that's a that's a, a maker's stamp. It's three initials, and it would be used on your tools because you want to make sure people didn't walk off with your tools. There'd always be a, a the, the, the people who made it, and then you would also get the owner's marks. And you can usually tell the owner's marks don't look anywhere near as perfectly centered or the like. Um, so, for instance, right here we've got um, that's a Kingston. This is on the iron. Oh no, excuse me. This is on the. Oh yes, this is the marks from the iron. On, nope, nope. This is the marks on. Yeah, yes, that's a, that's the Xerox. So the, on the end there, this is a, a blow up of it. It's nice because you. Get, so a JH Rusa, famous name here. This plane was made in Kingston, New York. Can't quite read the the maker's name, and JH Rusa was the owner. And you notice how it's not nice and how the how the, the maker's stamps are all square and, and and lined up, and then the. The owner's stamp is kind of wherever it fits, right? One of these other planes, I, I might point out too, this the Coffin Smoother, was from the Auburn Tool Company. And that's a story in and of itself because in Auburn, New York, in the western part of the state, there was a prison, and it was a particularly tough prison. You weren't ever allowed to talk. You were in solitary confinement, and they made tools. They made woodworking tools. And it's even got the name on it, uh, the iron has got another name, but it's a trade name, Ogon's Tool Company and Sandusky Tool, Tool Iron. But these two names all were names um, from that same company. Wooden mallets. I think we've got everybody in there. And now we're winding up. We're kind of running, running out of tools to show you today. It, it sure is hot in here, too. Hey, let's get money for air conditioning next. What do you say, huh? This is a, uh, this particular device is a Howl. Uh, it's probably European made because apparently they weren't made in America. It's made for making um, round either um, poles on a boat or whatever. I think they're largely in ship building, but it's a thing that you, you clamp around a piece of wood to make a round dowel or a round pole out of it. As you can see, it's adjustable, so this could do up to, well, up to about three or four inches. They must have had bigger ones. I've only ever seen this one. Yes, yeah, so was that uh, James Stiles? Was that the name on it there? I, I didn't memorize uh, such things over there, uh, David, but, uh, but, but yes, Kingston, New York, because of the D&H Canal, uh, a big, big center of all sorts of industry. Uh, important place. Wonderful place, too. Here's an interesting tool I don't think I've seen but one, this one. Uh, probably for making, um, obviously for drilling holes, a very early type of spoon bit. I've seen smaller bits like this, like the size of, you know, a quarter inch or whatever. This is uh, ginormous. This has got to be an almost two-inch hole that it would do. The pole making tool is made of, I would say that's a piece of maple or something in the maple family, sycamore maple. It's very fine grained, doesn't have the open grain that you'd expect to see in, uh, in oak and hickory and those other woods. Oak and hickory more often used for handles because of shock resistance primarily for, for tool and axe handles, uh, hammer handles. Here's an auger. Again, I've seen many tiny ones. I have collections of them. This is obviously for drilling longer holes. And in fact, you can actually find some, I, you know, that, that reminded me right here. The very earliest water pipes were actually made with augers like this one. And they would literally drill just the way this is set up on this uh, support post. They would drill down it. So this tool is six foot, oh, six and a half foot, because I'm six foot. This is an auger that would have been used to, to, to auger out a... Uh, a water pipe way back before they had the metal making capabilities but this other auger here is just a uh, is a uh, still big I mean I've seen some that are just as you know yay big but this is about uh, a little under three feet I'm going to say uh, but again if you need to do a long hole in something and to round out boring tools as I get ready to close out here this you know, when I read about these guys, this is another type of auger or uh, um, I think there's another name for it, but my, my brain is overheating now. Um, these were made for, for um, carriage hubs. And I, and I, and I thought that's strange because I didn't realize they were tapered. But for whatever reasons, 
uh, the, 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 the carriage wheels had tapered holes in them. And this, this is what this tool was used for, probably a later handle here. But uh, this is, again, kind of like a, a spoon bit. And again, you know, just if you, once you have a blacksmith around and once you know you need a tool, you would just sort of sit there and, uh, and make whatever tools you needed kind of thing. And just, I'm going to close out today. Thank you all for joining me. Um, you know, I see a lot of tin lanterns in the antique trade, and most of them are probably the repros from the middle of the 20th century. But this one, I believe, is actually from the 19th century. I think this is a, an actual earlier, earlier one. Yes, uh, um, pipes for wells. You know, uh, uh, my friend John Cox points out that the Chase Manhattan, um, thank you, Stuart, uh, um, would, would pipes be bored green or dry? I don't know, uh, Rick. That's a good question. Maybe uh, David just put up the name of that book. It might tell you about it. The Chase Manhattan logo is actually <coughs> a stylized water pipe because they somehow, they, 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 uh, they, they must have paid to run the water in Manhattan way back when. Just an interesting sort of sideline there. But uh, it's an awful hot day. I'm happy to say today I uh, took care of my technical problems. But I think it's time for me to say goodbye. And thank you for joining me. And we'll try and put up some other content later in the, later probably in the fall. But uh, this is the end of part two of the Peter Sinclair Tour Room. Thank you very much, everybody.